welcome back from the, from the tea break. If you can just take a moment, again, put your cell phones on silent or vibrate mode. Extremely pleased to introduce our next uh, panel, uh, Leadership and Governance in Changing Times. Uh, our panelists are who are already on stage and ready to go. Let me quickly introduce them. Mehreen Ahmed, who's a group head retail banking at Bank Al Fala Limited. Fahad Kamal Chinoy, who's the chief executive officer of Pakistan Cables. Mohsin Manji, who's the chief strategy officer at Pakistan State Oil. And Humayun Akhlaq Sahab, who's the CEO and country president of Schneider Electric Pakistan and VP at the Management Association of Pakistan. And of course, our esteemed moderator, Adnan Rizvi, who's a partner and national head of advisory, KPMG in Pakistan. Can we please give them a very big round of applause? And Adnan Sahib, over to you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, warm welcome to all the panelists and uh, assalamu alaikum, uh, good morning to all uh, attendees. Uh, MAP convention has always been a very sort of, uh, uh, headline event uh, of the corporate calendar and uh, I've always relished uh, participating in it as a as a sort of uh, guest and now this is an opportunity to uh, have a session with the business leaders uh, on uh, the topic of leadership. So, uh, so let's begin. We have 30 minutes uh, and uh, we'll try to cover some of the key themes uh, in these 30 minutes. Uh, the, the, the topic uh, specifically is basically leadership and governance in changing times. So uh, changing times, as we all know, uh, relates to these past two years, uh, primarily the COVID related uh, issues which we faced and where we are now in a completely changed world. And in, in this world, while things have changed in terms of the working environment and uh, also the challenges uh, which, which the leadership is facing, uh, a parallel theme has emerged and has now taken over, uh, I would say essentially, uh, the ESG. Uh, there used to be the CSR and now we have moved towards ESG, so which is now prevalent in almost all aspects of our uh, sort of business lives. So, so I'll uh, uh, ask a few questions uh, to the panelists and starting from Maureen. Uh, I think that uh, being a, a established banker and uh, a very experienced one, how do you see the, this impact of ESG coming along on, on, on the things which you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what are the uh, discussions in the, in, in the boardroom or in the leadership corridors uh, regarding ESG and what uh, 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 leaders should do about it. Thank you, Adan. It's still early days for ESG. Uh, conceptually, I think everybody is clear uh, in terms of you know what those broad uh, pillars are and what are those initiatives that need to be executed <clears throat> within those broad pillars to be able to do that. But I think um, generally uh, for the industry as a whole, still early days. Uh, we, we are required to do disclosures uh, on an annual basis. It's, it's still not mandatory, but the fact that it's there and for the last three years, I know uh, for a fact for Bank Alfala, we've been making those disclosures uh, on an optional basis. And uh, when you actually sit down and see all that you've done in the past year or past couple of years, I think there's a long list of things that we have done. Uh, and ESG, as you know, is a fairly broad topic uh, and it gives you the leeway to do different things. Um, so um, I think poverty alleviation, gender equality, green energy, uh, education, health, well-being, and some of those things are also coming uh, out of the COVID environment that, that we've been in for the last uh, two years. So um, I think uh, broadly, I would say that there is work happening uh, across the industry, but we are yet to see the real benefits and the real success uh, coming out of it. Right now, it's more of a disclosure. It's more of uh, you know something which is nice to have. Uh, but how it translates into all the benefits that uh, ESG is supposed to bring to organizations, I think that's still in early stages. And, and for that, I think a lot of work still needs to be done. Awareness uh, needs to get enhanced. Uh, we need to make uh, probably examples out of 
uh, organizations or initiatives that have really gained success uh, in these areas. Uh, and also, I think uh, we need capability within the organization. Uh, we need people who understand this. You know, if you go around and ask, uh, you know, people within the organization, uh, very few will be able to really tell you exactly what this is and how to go about. Because I think every everyone in the organization, I think, has a role to play in this. So I know um, organizations in the West are uh, hiring chief sustainability officers, for example. It's a it's a very structured uh, job uh, role that have been created just to sort of you know support and facilitate this uh, push this initiative. So I think uh, that those are the, the you know the things that industry as a whole you know needs to do to be able to uh, extend this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is very useful. Uh, and this is, I think, generally how it is. It is evolving, and 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 people are uh, getting to know what's it. So, Mohsen, you are the chief uh, strategy officer. So, in PSO, when you are developing a strategy, does ESG come into play, or, or it's still it's with the with the finance guys or the ones who are looking after the annual reports and those kind of things? Well, uh, when we say at PSO, like initially we were more focused on CSR, as you just mentioned. So we do not define it as ES, uh, ESG, but when you look at the broader strategy that PSO is in the process of developing, we recently came up with a three-pronged uh, strategy to deal with uh, all the three elements which is covered in the ESG. Uh, what if, if you look at ESG as a, as a paradigm shift, the way the business engages with the environment, uh, with the society, and uh, in the end, uh, the shareholders and the employees and everyone else involved, all the stakeholders. In this paradigm, like initially, the way the, it was focused more on a social welfare work. It was not a business strategy as such. Now we are transforming it in a way that it's an essential element of our business practice. So if I just give an example of uh, PSO and we're in the process of developing this strategy, which will hopefully will be approved by the board and the government eventually, we are working on a three-pronged strategy uh, that uh, from the environmental perspective, we, A is generating recognition how much we are consuming in terms of energy ourselves as a company, uh, the water, the, all the resources. The second thing is just to optimize that consumption and see how it impacts the rest of the society. Because like when you deal in Pakistan for an energy sector company, we just straight away go to EV. Uh, what we are doing is, is a three-pronged strategy. So first, we bring down our own internal con uh, consumption down for energy, water, paper. Then we convert it into a more environmental friendly fuels. And then we get into the business practice of moving towards energy paradigm. But that's just one aspect. What we have to do is to we have to engage the society on a far deeper scale. Uh, we have to engage with our environment on a far deeper scale. But it's, it's as she mentioned that it's just in a very infancy stage right now. So what what I'm trying to say is that the strategy we are developing will eventually be uh, ESG framework. It's not currently recognized as one, but yes, we are aware of it, and we are trying to build awareness in our consumers, in our employees, in our stakeholders, in our partners. Thank you. Thank you, Musa. So, uh, Akhlaq Sahib, basically being a multinational, uh, Schneider, I, I'm sure that uh, there will be a lot of push from your, from your global side on initiatives like ESG. So, how does it uh, sort of translates into the local environment and what challenges you face in actually complying with the, the global standards which your company must be following internationally? Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adnan Sahib. So, as you rightly mentioned, sir, ke, as part of a global organization and uh, as part of a global organization and um, especially representing the energy and power uh, uh, sector in all our products and services. Uh, and as uh, Mehreen rightfully pointed out, we are one of those companies who do have a chief sustainability officer, you know, and uh, we, we, it is, uh, it is a way of life in everything we do day in and day out from a company strategy, from execution, from the way we market or manufacture our products and the way we service our customers. And as we heard earlier in the day from our distinguished uh, keynote speakers, uh, 
ESG is at the top of the agenda of many governments, investors, and society at large. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, climate change and social inequality are one of the biggest challenges of our generation. But the good thing is that there are now technologies available which are uh, affordable, which are digital, uh, which uh, can, can bring the operational efficiencies in, uh, in any company or any business. Uh, they are easy to implement. And the companies, it's good to see that in Pakistan also, you know, many of our customers have embarked and, you know, the gentleman sitting to my left uh, 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 has taken the lead through his company. And, they, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, advocate of what they're doing for, from, from that perspective. But many of our other customers, so uh, also our company philosophy is that electrification and digitization can really address climate change. If, if it's implemented in a, in a correct way and you and electricity being uh, one of the, uh, the the best source of energy that uh, also addresses uh, the the, uh, the decarbonization improves the uh, the, the emissions uh, also and, and as one of our uh, goals as part of the sustainability KPI is that we have to contribute towards that not only uh, the way we manufacture our products and, and solutions and services and the way we market them and sell them around the world, but also to, to enable at our customer end to bring more operational efficiencies in their environment, uh, enabling their people uh, to become more digital savvy uh, on, on how to manage the operation and also uh, become more profitable uh, uh, you know in, in, in running by running reducing the costs and uh, and bringing down especially the energy costs with some of our solutions that you, once they go into uh, production that can you know bring energy savings to as high as 80 85% and in the next 20 years uh, almost 60 uh, or 40% of uh, of the electricity will be generated through alternative methods. So, so, so the world is headed that way, and I'm happy to say that you know I think uh, with the with the right framework and focus, uh, many of our top conglomerates and companies uh, in Pakistan are also very successfully implementing this strategy. Thank you, Khalasa. Uh, very useful. Fahad, uh, I think uh, Pakistan Cables is definitely one of those entities which is which uh, I know personally is doing a lot in terms of the, the, the various segments of the environment socially in the governance area. So, so uh, when you look at it as a, as a combo of the ESG uh, sort of branding, the way things are, I think I think you guys were already on, on the path uh, in your various segments. Uh, uh, and and um, so how is it coming up in an organizational way? And I would add another question, so, so from you we'll start, is that in addition to this ESG uh, theme, what are the other challenges which, which uh, an organization like uh, uh, Pakistan Cables is, is facing in terms of the leadership challenges, please? Thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, I appreciate uh, the, the comments. Uh, very kind of, uh, very kind of you. I, I'd just like to comment that our group uh, sort of has been focused and oriented towards governance for a long time, um, and so we have strong governance structures in place that have uh, evolved over the years. But generally, we rely on a very strong uh, board, diverse board with independent directors, uh, well represented. Uh, and I think so for for the for the for the G part of the ESG, we've been we've been doing reasonably well over a, a reasonable period of time. Um, also on the S part, I think, you know, we've been investing in uh, the communities around us, we've been supportive, we've been proactive on the CSR front. But the pivot for us recently has been on the E side, on the environment side, and um, particularly for Pakistan Cables, uh, we being sort of a key stakeholder in the energy value chain, we had a sort of front row seat to the shift that started taking place towards renewables, um, and uh, when we saw that happening, uh, we sort of did a little bit of internal analysis and uh, decided that we wanted to pivot towards uh, the environment as well. Um, and we've taken a couple of initiatives which we're pretty proud of. Uh, one is our uh, urban forest. We have set up a three-acre urban forest in Nuriabad. We have over 40,000 trees already planted. 
Uh, it's a um, you know vibrant uh, forest already uh, just after two years uh, in a very arid environment. So I think that's been a great success. And in addition to that, what we've done is we've been sort of promoting that approach to other big corporates, policymakers, and so on. And we've had, uh, so it's not purely just a, uh, you know, positioning play for our company, but it's a, a genuine, uh, you know, desire for others to also follow suit. And we've had at least three companies who are actively pursuing it right now. Uh, and I would encourage anyone who would like to come and see, to come and visit our urban forest and, you know, maybe consider a similar initiative for yourselves. Uh, in addition to that, we've been uh, investing in innovation. Um, uh, so we've, inno uh, we've bought in a new product for, uh, the transmission uh, network, um, given that's th that that is our business. Um, so we talk about generation, and in Pakistan, generation primarily is at this point in time driven by fossil fuel, and there is a push for re renewable, but there's a long way to go. Uh, but at the same time, the investment on the grid has been limited. Uh, so we bought in a high technology overhead line conductor. Very simply, what it does is it reduces the line losses by 30 percent, doubles the output of the line by almost 100 percent and reduces the carbon footprint by 30%. Um, so I think with those two particular initiatives, and then lastly, we um, have signed up probably as the first non-textile company in Pakistan uh, for the net zero emissions, the race to zero, uh, and we were amongst the first 26 companies in Pakistan. So we've really committed ourselves over a long term towards uh, environment. Um, with respect to your question on uh, sort of general leadership and, you know, how, how things are evolving and, uh, you know, how, how we're addressing that, um, you know, firstly, I think that there are a couple of uh, areas we're looking at. One is that we're collectively looking to sort of leverage our group strength. We have three companies in our group, uh, well represented over here. We have international industries, international steel and Pakistan cables. In the past, largely operating, you know, as independent verticals, but now we're trying to sort of consolidate that and not only does that positively impact our business, but how we can then leverage that strength to bring about improvement in community and, and, and uh, improvement in environment, uh, you know, and, and, and all of these fundamentals. Um, and lastly, I think, uh, you know, just setting the vision. I think it's very key in these kind of evolving times uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty, every day is a new day, uh, that there's clarity in direction. Um, so that must first be set. Uh, it should be built up uh, from, from the grassroots rather than just sort of, uh, you know, just defining it at the leadership level and asking others to follow. People need to believe in the story. And then after that, communication. Communication is the key. So you set the, you set the direction and then you communicate, you communicate and you communicate. And that really helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. For so, Khlaq sahab, what, uh, what are the leadership challenges? Uh, what, what are the themes coming up uh, exactly in these uh, challenging times, in these current times? Uh, a couple what, of, couple what, of what keeps us light up light. at night? Uh, <laughs> kind of I, I hope you're not up at night, but <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, otherwise, during the daytime, what are the challenges? No, I I think the last two years uh, as a as a business leader, and and you know there are so many in this room. Uh, and I, I hope they agree with me that I think with COVID hitting us in 2020 and not just us, but globally, you know, the supply chain disruptions, the logistic challenges, the, the health and safety of the people and colleagues, you know, that really took the, was at the top of the agenda that combined with some climate related disasters, I think really sunk in the realization in all of us, especially as leaders that uh, working towards a sustainable future is is everyone's responsibility and everyone's job. So with that, you know, I think many companies and including, you know, in Pakistan and globally, including our, uh, ours as well, it gave us an opportunity to really uh, revisit our strategy, uh, reinvent ourselves, transform ourselves. And, and we, we are still in the middle of that transformation moving more into the, the digital space from our offering uh, and the way we manage uh, our customer environments perspective, the products that we, so the concept of what came into IT many years ago uh, of, uh, of connected devices, where your mobile, your laptop, your uh, iPad, all those devices are talking to each other. The same is now being implemented in the electrical infrastructure space as well, where the grid is talking to the transformer, transformer is talking to uh, the panels, the panel is talking to the circuit breakers and how they are connected and with a single pane of glass, uh, uh, glass 
you can manage, which brings uh, the efficiencies uh, in the system, in the operations, because whether you look at homes or buildings or data centers or industry, electrical you know, use is heavy uh, in all these areas. Uh, and also it makes organizations more res resilient. Now the challenge now after you know building all this spiel, the challenge that keeps me up at night is that with all this innovation happening at a global scale and at a local level, uh, how do we upskill our people to to really you know see see the future and come out of the legacy the way we used to manage the business, the, the whether technical or commercial or interact our interactions with our customer, and that is uh, you know. What I see, I think, and it, it as as a leader, you know, I cannot limit that as a as a lip service in my organization where I go around and talk to my colleagues that you know, please, you know, bring, uh, go through a certain training or build a certain level of expertise. It has to be part uh, of the strategy. It has to be part of the plan, backed up by adequate budgets to to support this initiative, and be monitored on a quarterly basis as a KPI. Whether you put them in their goals or objectives or make it a company-wide goal, but that upskilling, I I think, is it going to be really critical uh, uh, for 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 us as an industry. And, and if I talk about myself uh, as a company, to bring those people and move them away from the traditional or the legacy way of doing things to a more digitized way of uh, uh, doing everything across the organization. Thank you. So the hybrid uh, work environment is, is prevalent in your organization, the work from home and uh, working at the office, is it, is it, uh, is it implemented actually? Yes, so absolutely. Uh, uh, so as of last year, early last year, at a company-wide level, uh, there was an HR initiative whereby we have now given our colleagues uh, the flexibility to work two days from home. Uh, and this applies across the board, uh, regardless of the territory we operate in. And we have equipped them with enough technology that it should not hamper or become an impediment uh, towards their performance or, or the way they go about their job on a day-to-day basis. Thank you. Thank you, Sahar. Mohsen, uh, what is the top challenge? you guys face at PSO? Well, uh, when I look at PSO, I think the way, the biggest challenge that PSO is facing is the very aggressive transformation the world is going through and our capability to handle that transformation. Because PSO is not just a company which is looking, uh, which is into profits or into a business thing. It's managing the energy supply chain of the country. Uh, it, it's, it's for the crisis management as well. So what, when we look at the environment today, what we, we are, what we are looking at, we are looking at the energy movement, the digitization, but there is also a very broad social impact that we, uh, that all those changes will have. For example, like we are an oil marketing company, the world may transform to hydrogen or EVs as everyone is talking today. Uh, the idea is like when we look at that proper challenges, we can transform into those newer fuels. But then we have so many stakeholders who have invested into the existing system. There are 10,000 retail outlets, the capital invested, there are infrastructure investment, the oil handling business. Then there are vehicles and the people who are, employment is linked to those vehicles. When you go out today in the market and you look at the mechanic and you try to find a mechanic who can handle an electrically intense car and you will have your challenge right there. So those, this broader impact, as you were earlier referring, the ESG, that if you have to build that framework in which when you are transforming and you're bringing in something new, you are keeping every one, every single stakeholder together which requires a, a far deeper level of engagement with the universities that you bring up the resources which are more tuned towards newer technologies and digitization. You cannot really make the existing workforce irrelevant uh, on, a, on a micro level because you have, this transformation has to be very macro in nature and you have to take the entire society with you. So the biggest challenge as a strategist I have to see how I will keep all those stakeholders aligned to the major transformation which is going to hit Pakistan regardless we like it or not, and which will be the cleaner fuels and the digitization which will be requiring a workforce 
which is far more tax savvy than it already is. And how you're going to bring that change and what role we have to play as the corporate leaders in that transformation and that disruptive technology movement, which is coming our way very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. What about the hybrid uh, work environment? PSO, you have uh, any, any option of work at home right now? Or? Yeah, we actually for a good six months, we operated from home. Uh, in fact, almost a year. Hmm. There are a number of new initiatives we have taken, which we are uh, moving towards a virtual environment now. Okay. Uh, we have started digitizing and virtually connecting uh, all our terminals. We have one fully automated terminal now in Kimari. Okay. So we can actually, it's a, it's a kind of an unmanned terminal. Uh, right. We are moving on three, four more. Uh, at the same time, most of our retail, we have implemented this dig uh, digitally integrated our retail outlets as well. So we can actually uh, monitor the performance of the retail outlet. Uh, we can uh, from from the central server. We are also actually so we are what we are trying to do is to minimize the human interface and his physical presence. Okay. So it was not the hybrid for us is not just working from home Thank and you. using a Zoom meeting. So it's, it's actually far greater. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Marine, what about the? Biggest challenge <laughs> at Bank Alphala, the banking sector, the overall business environment, uh, we have come out of this uh, pandemic. I think the, the biggest challenge during the pandemic has been, uh, you know, keeping our uh, employees and our leadership team safe. I think uh, at the peak of COVID in 2020, that really was, uh, that took center stage, no doubt about it, because we're a service organization. Uh, we, we have high density areas uh, where we work from, particularly the area that I manage is very high density retail and consumer. Uh, then, of course, we're a customer facing organization. Uh, we have over 700 branches. So keeping everybody safe, particularly in high density areas, the interactions that we were doing, uh, I think that uh, was top priority in those times. And uh, then I think, obviously, to be able to, you know, keep uh, the workflow going. Uh, so te technology came in and I think uh, we did a reasonably good job in terms of transforming to newer ways of working. So that that happened fairly quickly. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, remote banking or hybrid banking, uh, you know, that we've started hybrid sort of working that we've started doing, um, uh, it will continue in some form or the other. I can't say, I have to be honest that, you know, we, we have now gone back to our, you know, previous ways of doing uh, work but I think it does give you an option it gives you a very strong option you know previously if somebody was not feeling well or somebody had some issues family issues they would just take the day off or take a couple of days off now you know uh, what they normally do is they say you know uh, you get a message you know from your direct report saying that can I work from home today you know so it's added a lot of flexibility and I think managers as leaders, we are also more confident. Initially, we were also jittery that, okay, you know, because working from home was a no-no in our culture, uh, you know, basically the trust factor uh, uh, was not really there. But now I think everybody is more comfortable. And uh, the leaders have uh, set examples, the CEO himself or the leadership team, people who could work from home just to set an example, look, this is possible. So that's, uh, and, you know, and, there's this other side of the story also, because the younger lot I feel, because I manage a very large and a young team, uh, and I felt that whenever during COVID or even now as we're coming out of COVID, whenever we did, you know, these big uh, sort of, you know, interactions, getting about 100 people together or 200 people together, I felt that they were so starved of social interaction. You know, the younger lot thrives on, on, on this. You know, they might say that, okay, you know, it's it's very nice to have uh, working from home, but I think people want to get back uh, in, into that rhythm uh, and they need that social interaction. And also from the company's uh, perspective, it's very hard to build a very rich culture on the basis of just online interactions. Uh, you can't build great companies uh, through online interactions. You've got to have physical, and I think in Pakistan particularly, that's very relevant. The other challenge that I think we've always uh, been very um, aware of and uh, have tried to manage it is really our um, loan portfolios. I think that's something that's really kept us awake. Uh, the regulator was, I think, very proactive in coming out with uh, schemes 
uh, for customers uh, to to sort of you know ease the burden uh, on the customers and uh, and therefore it helped the banks in you know steering uh, their way through uh, this crisis. Uh, but I think uh, we're not out of the woods, and uh, that effort will have to remain uh, in. Thirdly, I think uh, as uh, some of my fellow members on the panel mentioned digitization. Um, we were, I'll tell you about Bank Alphala. Prior to COVID, about 45, 46% of our transactions were uh, happening on digi digital channels. Today, we are at 65%. And, uh, and we've promised the CEO that hopefully, inshallah, in the next one year, COVID or no COVID, we'll take it up to at least 75%. So I think this, this is a good habit that yes. we've inculcated in ourselves and in our customers. There's still a lot to be done, but I think we're on the right track. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. So I think I've asked everyone else, Fahad, the last question for you as to how the hybrid work environment is coming along in, in Pakistan Cables or your group. Yeah, I think uh, I, I remember being here about three or four years ago and uh, MAP had an event, it was called Rise of the Millennials. And uh, one of the things that were discussed quite a bit was that the desire for millennials is, amongst other things, is a more balanced work-life balance. Uh, and I think COVID really sort of was a catalyst for, you know, organizations adjusting to that particular need. Of course, it was a necessity based on the, you know, uh, the times that we were, we were undergoing. Um, but we, as at Pakistan Cables, we went to work from home, I think, a week or 10 days before the government mandated it. Um, and we've been sort of in and out of this sort of work from home conundrum back and forth, uh, depending on uh, when, when, you know, the, the cases rise and when they're, when they're stabilized. Um, what we learned was that despite our uh, expectations otherwise was that we were pretty productive uh, working from home because we had the systems in place to support that. And so long as people have their goals, their objectives and the right kind of facilities available to themselves, mm -hmm. they can be productive. So I think that that was a great learning for us. Um, but at, uh, and, and I think that we could easily adjust to a hybrid model going forward. But having said that, you know, offices are spaces for collaboration and face to face collaboration cannot be sort of overcome by digital in my opinion. So, so long as we can balance it out, I think that's, uh, that's a good sort of mix to have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fahad, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, so, over to you, Ravia. Thank you. Thank you so much. What, a, what an interesting uh, uh, array of uh, discussions going on here. Uh, to give our, uh, to, to present the mementos for this session, I'd like to invite Dr. Amjad Wahid, who's the president of the NBP Fund, to join me on stage. And with him, may I please invite uh, Khalid Zaman Khan, who's an executive committee member of the Management Association of Pakistan. Kindly join me on stage. May I please request the group head retail banking, uh, retail banking at Bank Al Fala Limited, Ms. Mehreen Ahmed, to uh, accept the token of our gratitude for all your insights and for being part of the panel today. May I request the Chief Executive Officer of Pakistan Cables, Mr. Fahad Kamal Chinoy. May I request uh, Mohsin Manji to, stay, to step up and accept the token of our gratitude. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Pakistan State Oil. And uh, our uh, last panelist, Humayu Akhla, who is the CEO and Country President of uh, Schneider Electric Pakistan and VP of the Management Association of Pakistan. And of course, it's always the burden on uh, the moderator to keep the discussion alive. Um, the partner and uh, uh, a partner and national head of advisory at KPMG in Pakistan, Mr. Adnan Rizvi. If I could please request the entire panel with our guests to uh, kindly have a group photograph. <laughs> <laughs>